Night vision is pretty cool, but when it comes to game-changing imaging technology, nothing really beats thermal. In this video, I'm going to be talking about a new thermal imaging camera that is super easy to use and literally saved me from losing thousands of dollars worth of food from my pantry. And I'm also going to be coming at this from a different perspective by trying to make myself invisible to thermal cameras by using simple and cheap materials that right now anyone can buy. Before we get into this video where I'm going to be talking about a very specific thermal camera and some of the pros and cons of that unit, I wanted to talk about my plans for how to defeat that unit and to be able to sneak up on someone using that technology in a way that I think, I'm hoping, is going to allow me to be invisible. And to do that, I'm using Mylar. Mylar is a thin, reflective coating. It reflects the light that hits it, and in the same way that it reflects visual, uh, visible light, I'm thinking that it probably has a pretty good chance of uh, reflecting infrared light as well. This is oftentimes used to re reflect infrared light back into a space as an insulating uh, blanket. It's also used uh, for people who uh, are growing plants indoors and they want to reflect as much light onto the plants as possible. Uh, mylar film is used to reflect uh, you know, wavelengths of light and uh, even going into the infrared. So what I've done here is I've made a sheet shield out of this uh, piece of scrap. Here I've got a, a stick on the um, top, stick on the bottom, and a stick holding them together with a little handle. And it's a little bit more narrow than I would like, but I think if I kind of tuck in my shoulders, I should be able to get behind it. The reason it's this width is because this is the piece of scrap that I happen to have. I think 33%, uh, you know, a third bigger would be a little nicer, but for the purpose of this test, I think it'll work pretty well. And my hope is that I should be able to sneak up on someone behind the mylar and I'm thinking that this is going to allow me to uh, you know, sneak up on them without them seeing me, even on thermal imaging, which is a real game changer when it comes to visibility at night. But before we get to that challenge later in the video, let's start talking about my adversary, which is the specific camera that I'm up against. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, I'm talking about this Top Dawn thermal imaging device. I want to say right from the outset that I did not buy this. It was sent to me uh, for me to review, honestly, and I'm going to give you my honest review. I'm mostly very happy with it. There is about like one and a half things about it that I don't like, and I am going to share those things with you. The one thing that I love about this is that it totally saved my pantry. My pantry has been kind of the Achilles heel of my build uh, since the very beginning. All the systems at the new house worked really, really well. Well, this is the second house that I've built, so they're all kind of version 2.0 systems, so most of them were kind of upgraded and improved. But the pantry never really worked that well. It was always having trouble keeping it cool. In fact, there would be some mornings where I'd have windows open at night in the rest of the house, and then I'd come into the pantry in the morning, and it'd actually be warmer in the pantry than it was anywhere else in the rest of the house. So it was always, uh, you know, this part of the whole system that just wasn't working very well until I gave it a really good scan with this and I was able to find exactly where the heat was coming into my pantry. And this device saved my pantry and now it's so cold that I actually kind of have to wear a shawl when I come in here. Now, granted, I'm still wearing shorts and flip flops. I'm, I'm a little bit chilly in here, um, but it's, it really, really feels more like a refrigerator in here than it used to. Uh, so this uh, device was what allowed me to do that. So. Really, really like it. I want to talk a little bit about it in this video. First off, what can you use this for? Well, you can use it for diagnosing uh, things like if you have heat getting into places you don't want heat, or if you have cold getting into places where you don't want cold, you can use it for that type of thing. They do make two different types of uh, styles here. Uh, this is like kind of their handheld uh, all-in-one uh, kind of unit that, uh, you know, sort of like a gun. Uh, they make another one that is an attachment on an iPhone. I have owned other thermal Im imaging devices, most notably by a company, uh, named FLIR or FLIR. I'm not sure if you pronounce that or if it's an acronym. Um, so they, they have a couple different devices and I you know I've used different thermal imaging devices before, but I really like this better than other ones that I've used before, mostly for the ease of use and the fact that the battery just lasts so long in this thing. And well, I am going to talk about the battery later on because there is an issue that I have with the battery and that's actually my major issue with this. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit at the end. You can use it outside. Uh, you can find wildlife with it. I was able to see, a, you know, I think, a deer and a bunch of bats that were flying over my house. So even something small like a bat, it can pick up on. You can scan the woods around you. It can very easily pick up to see where there are animals or creepy human beings hiding in your woods. 
And it's better than doing it with a flashlight because if you do it with a flashlight, you are going to really announce that you're looking through the woods. Now that said, this thing actually has a flashlight on it. I'll talk about that feature later, but you don't need to use the flashlight in order to use a thermal imaging device. In fact, the flashlight is just, it's kind of like an extra if you're working in a dark space, they give you a convenient little flashlight that you can uh, turn on in here. It's nice using thermal imaging to scan woods versus a flashlight because it's not really obvious that you're scanning the woods like it is with a flashlight. Now that said, the screen on this, I'm gonna turn it on right now by, it has a really simple display there's just a uh, on off button here you hold for a couple seconds to turn it on and the display even though it's not super bright uh, it does cast a little bit of light on your face at night so if you were standing in pitch black and you're kind of scanning around with this it is going to throw a little bit of light on your face that's different than having like kind of like goggles that go right up to your face and they might have like a um, an open close kind of um, uh, switch on them so you can keep them closed until they go up to your eye and then you can open them up so you don't have any of that kind of light spill but a heck of a lot less light uh, than if you're you're shooting a flashlight into the woods so you know just for getting a sense of what's around you it's a useful tool but mostly for me I've used it as a diagnostic tool okay so this is all really fascinating about how well this unit works but what I'm interested in is can I defeat this unit using this mylar film shield so uh, the way that I want to run this is that I'm going to be recording a clip with this unit while I walk up without the shield. That's kind of the control recording. So we'll see what things look like without uh, using the shield. And then I'm going to do a second pass where I'm using the shield and we're going to see you know, how well it's able to mask my body. One thing that I have in my mind that uh, I need to keep in, in mind while I'm doing this is that this isn't just an invisibility shield. This is literally uh, reflecting something. And whatever I'm going to be reflecting in the direction of this unit here should be something that matches what's behind me. So if there is cool materials behind me, I want to have this so that it's banking cool uh, materials over at this camera. Off into the forest over here, that was very shady, just the same as this forest is over here. So I would probably want to have this sh uh, shield angled a little bit. If I were to take this shield and angle it up towards the sky, I'm going to be getting all the radiated heat coming off of the sky, uh, and that would be like a beacon for me. So those are the things that are kind of running through my mind right now. I'm going to run this experiment and see how it goes. But the first uh, time you do an experiment, you want to do the experiment without whatever it is that you're trying to test. That's called your control group. And we're going to be doing the control group right now with just my body. Here I hid behind a tree. Now I'm hidden in the camera. But as soon as I jump out from behind that tree, it is super, super obvious that there's this glowing Sasquatch moving towards the camera. So this is really the strength of thermal imaging, is that even if you're colored the same, even if you, you know, put sticks and things all over you, you just emit that kind of glow out of yourself. So, you know, that is why you need some other uh, approach to trying to, you know, mask yourself. This time, I'm gonna be using my magic space shield. Here we go. Okay, so I've emerged, and that's pretty good. I can see my feet a little bit, and that comes down to like the size of this unit that I had, but uh, it's much more uh, uh, subtle. You know, honestly, I, I'm a little surprised. I didn't think it was gonna work this well. I, I'm seeing just a little bit of myself kind of poking out from uh, behind the sides of the shield, but uh, that works really well, actually. I, you know, I, I was thinking I might've left a little bit of a heat signature on the front surface of it that works pretty well if i'm just made a larger shield and again i just i chose the size of that shield based on uh you know the the piece of scrap that i happen to have if i just made an appropriately sized shield that's a pretty darn good way of of camouflaging yourself i i, I was thinking that i I didn't think it was actually going to work that well. I thought that I was going to be maybe picking up reflections of heat signatures in other areas, but I was trying to do that angle thing and trying to bank it into uh, places that were of similar um, temperature. And wow, okay. So if you want to defeat thermal imaging, if you, you know, for purely legal reasons, you, you, you got some pal and he's got a thermal camera, and it's just like a, an ongoing gag between you guys. <laughs> and I'm just gonna kind of run through it a little bit. One of the things I like best about this is the simplicity of use. If you wanna take a picture, there's this little trigger here, you pull it and that takes a picture and it gives you the opp opportunity to either save it or not save it. I'm gonna say, don't save that. Um, and if you want to do a video, which I really like, uh, you just uh, kind of long press on the trigger and I'm gonna roll a video here so you can pop it up, I'll pop it up on the screen later and you get a chance to see what, uh, 
what that's all like. So I'm ro rolling the video right now and uh, you can get kind of get a sense of what it's like to look through one of these. I'm gonna just walk to the back over here. You can see just generally with me, things that are brighter are hotter, things that are darker are cooler. There's a little uh, temperature gauge on the side uh, and that says uh, at the top what the hottest thing in the image is and then at the bottom what the coolest thing in the image is. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of scan around here. Uh, this is where my chest freezer used to be and it's finally being allowed to uh, cool down because I removed my chest freezer. That turns out to have been what the issue was. I had a chest freezer that I put in here. I figured, well, pantry is a good place for it because it's gonna be kind of cool. It, wouldn't ha it won't have to work too hard. It had some vents on the side and I would oftentimes put my hand near the vents and I never felt an awful lot of heat coming out. But when I used this device, to scan the chest freezer, I found out that the, all the sides of the chest freezer were radiating heat at almost 90 degrees uh, to get rid of uh, the heat that it was extracting out of the food inside. So I essentially had an almost 90 degree radiator radiating heat out into the space. And that is why the pantry was not functioning very well for all those years. And it wasn't until I got this device that I was able to you know, determine that that was actually the cause. Now I have owned other devices in the past, but the battery life on them was never particularly uh, long. This is a really, really long battery life. It's only down to about 95% now. And I've just been running this thing for days and days. And I'm just gonna kind of scan around this area a little bit and you can kind of get a sense of, of how it works. Now I mentioned uh, there's a scale on the right that uh, shows at the top the hottest thing. Uh, at the moment it's just under 60 degrees and at the bottom the coolest thing uh, which in this field of view is just about 55 degrees. So I've got kind of a homogeneous mix of temperatures down here all in that kind of cool refrigerator kind of temperature range. It's, it's just between 55 and 60 and these are the kind of temperatures you want to have in a pantry. Now I'm going to pan kind of up here and my breaker box is here and you can see my breaker box is actually a little bit of a liability. You can see that the uh, temperature grade on the side has changed. Now the hottest thing in here is about 68 and a half and the coolest thing is 55 um, or 56 degrees and you can see that the hot areas are some of these breakers. There's a lot of uh, wasted heat coming out of these breakers. Interestingly, uh, the breakers that are really the hot breakers, those are these new, uh, these new style breakers that uh, are supposed to be safer, and apparently they create a lot of extra waste heat. Some of, some of these darker breakers, those are the old-fashioned breakers that uh, I, I kind of put in covertly later on uh, during my build, but uh, by code here, I was supposed to put in all these kind of new new breakers, which cost like 10 times as much and apparently waste a lot of electricity as well. But um, you can see in this image, if you were looking for where you were getting heat from, you can see exactly where it is. It's these breakers that are venting off a little bit of heat. Not nearly as much as that chest cooler was, but uh, definitely some heat. If we look up here, we can see the air conditioning unit and where the air is coming out is black. And you'll notice in the center of the image, there is a white crosshair and the white crosshair is uh, being used as kind of like a, like a, a spot uh, meter that will tell you exactly what temperature something is uh, if you aim it at it. So I'm aiming the white crosshairs at that black strip on the inside of the air conditioner. And in the upper left corner, you see it says about 45 and a half degrees, 44 and a half degrees, somewhere in there. That's telling me the temperature of that uh, that white crosshairs right in the middle. Uh, and that is a really, really handy tool. So if I'm kind of scanning a scene, I will look around and see what's kind of the hottest thing in the scene. Like right now, it looks like this bulb is the hottest thing. So I'm gonna aim the white crosshairs up at this little bulb. And that bulb is 77, 79, 80 degrees right in there. And then I'll move that crosshair down into these darker areas. And the crosshair is now reading 55 degrees or so. Also on the side, the scale is, is constantly gonna be changing and updating depending on what is in your scene. And I think that's a great way of kind of figuring out, you know, where are the hot spots, where are the cool spots. So I like that as a feature. There are a lot of different uh, ways of um, uh, visualizing the data that you can uh, run through here. I'm gonna stop the recording now by just pulling the, the trigger there. There are a lot of different uh, ways of visualizing the data that's in here. There's a really deep mem menu where I, you can really kind of customize even down to like the color palette and all that kind of stuff. So overall, I'm really, really happy with this device. It, it does have a little flashlight 
on it too. If you're working in a dark area, you can use that. You don't need to use the flashlight for scanning or anything. The, the flashlight's just if you're working in a dark area, it, you know, it's an extra little tool in there. They've got a whole place where you can go through the gallery of all the images that you've been recording. Um, it's a really great tool. Uh, the only thing that I'm not a huge fan about uh, when it comes to this, and has nothing to do with the functionality, is the battery on the inside. Uh, the battery, it lasts a long time. Uh, I'm still at like 95%. And again, I've been do using this thing for days and days and days. Um, the battery lasts a long time, but uh, there's no compartments to get in and replace the battery. Now, you, it's a rechargeable battery, obviously. Uh, you know, you wouldn't have like a one-off in here. But even rechargeable batteries, after several hundred or several thousand uh, uh, recharge cycles, eventually they will die. And it's probably going to take years and years, but eventually this thing is going to have a battery inside where the life is going to get less and less and less. And then... It, you can't replace the battery yourself. And I asked the manufacturer if it's possible to send it back to them and if they'll replace the battery. And they, their reply to me on that was that at least at this point in time, they, they aren't offering that service, which to me kind of makes it sound like they're not planning on offering that service. And I know that's the way a lot of products are today where it's not made for you to be able to replace the battery yourself. And an awful lot of them, it, you know, there's no service where you can even get the battery replaced. And I just don't like that kind of disposable mindset where we create these electronic devices with the with the forethought that this is going to end up in a landfill someday when you know when the battery dies and again it's probably going to be many many years until that happens and it's it's a great device and it's a great tool and it's really useful in the meantime but i just as an aesthetic i i'm not a huge fan of the idea of throwing things out now the only other thing that I, i'm not a fan about with this uh, product and i'm not 100 percent certain whether this even is going to be a problem but this surface on the top reminds me of that kind of surface that a lot of electronic devices and other handheld devices by now things like that have um, where it feels fine and actually feels really nice in your hands for the first several years but after like half a decade or so it starts getting a little bit slimy and like kind of tacky and this surface kind of reminds me of that now I'm not 100% certain that that is this surface but if it is a surface I actually recently discovered a way of removing that I've had a lot of things like flashlights binoculars I mentioned that have developed this kind of disgusting tacky kind of surface after several several years of just kind of sitting around to the point where you just don't want to touch them and you don't want to use them anymore. And I finally found out how you can remove that. So if you want to learn about how to, uh, you know, get rid of that tacky surface, if something like this ever has it someday, or if you have pre-existing kind of uh, devices that have that kind of an issue, at the end of this video, I'm going to put a link so you can click over to a recent video that I did about how to get rid of that kind of tacky surface. That's it. I hope you found this video entertaining and helpful. And again, if you want to find out how to save your devices that might get that tacky coating, again, I don't know whether this for certain will have that tacky coating or not, but it just, it's a little reminiscent of it. But if you have any devices that have that problem, end this video. I'm going to have a little pop-up so you can click on that video. It took me 10 years to figure out what solvent to use. I went through alcohol, turpentine, all kinds of different things. Finally found out the right solvent to use, and it's incredibly cheap. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people you see on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.